another installment in our Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor series. We are joined today by Maureen Parkinson of BC Cancer. Maureen has worked for over 25 years as the Provincial Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor at BC Cancer. She is the co-lead and content lead for cancerandwork.ca, a website designed to inform cancer survivors, employers, and healthcare providers on how to help cancer survivors stay, return to, and find work. She is a sessional instructor for Pacific Coast University teaching cancer and worker support as part of the Return to Work Coordinator Program. She has co-authored a commission paper for the Canadian Association of Psychosocial Oncology called Cancer and Work, a Canadian Perspective, and wrote Cancer and Work, a Practical Guide for Cancer Patients. She has a master's in counseling psychology, is a Canadian certified rehabilitation counselor, and completed the certified return to work coordinator program through the National Institute for Disability Management and Research. In today's webinar, Maureen will cover an introduction to the Cancer and Work website, 10 steps to return to work, and job search ideas for cancer survivors. So with that, I would like to pass it over to Maureen. Great, thank you so much to the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network to allow me to, um, and attendees who are um, listening, um, for allowing me to present on Cancer and Work. And before I move on, I'd like to acknowledge my co-lead on the Cancer and Work website, Dr. Christy Mayu, um, who was, was not able to make it today, but was very much involved in terms of um, assisting in terms of creating slides. So as Lindsay mentioned, we're going to talk about introduction to cancer and work, 10 steps to return to work, and job search ideas. So why is cancer work so important? Well, according to the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, in 2031, there will be 2.2 million Canadians living with cancer, and 40% of them will be um, uh, between the age of 20 and 65, so falling into uh, being a working population. So while we currently see 65% of working individuals return to work their first year post-diagnosis, for some we see that there's some challenges and between 26 to 53% of cancer survivors will lose their job or quit working during or after treatment. And just sort of a thought that not everybody necessarily returns to full time right away. We find 57% of individuals returning to work after cancer will experience reduced work hours for at least four hours a week. So why is it so important to um, assess and address concerns to return to work early? So while you want to balance um, getting ready for return to work, the longer somebody is off work, the harder it can be returned. So absolutely, you want to pay attention to your readiness, but if there's discretionary time in terms of getting back, it's important to get back as soon as you can. Uh, also, there are time limitations on availability insurance um, and services. Often, um, long-term disability providers might provide um, rehabilitation services, but they may not be available as you get further along with the claim and, and it's looking like you're going to no longer qualify. And, um, and there could be also time limitations in terms of returning to your former job. Sometimes companies will hold your job for so long. And the other thing is there can be, you know, obviously economic loss. Um, even if you're if you're having long-term disability, that's still only a certain percentage of your income. So for most people that are off work because of cancer, it means economic less loss. And also, you know, related to the social determinants of health, often having a lesser income, for example, people can have higher risks of um, health risks related to unemployment. So I'd like to first sort of talk about the Cancer Work website, um, which was initially funded by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer 216. And it has 500 pages of content, nine videos, eight online tools. It was, we had input, input and articles written by 27 expert writers. We also had um, guidance from Cancer, uh, Cancer Survivor Advisory Group. It's designed for healthcare providers, cancer survivors, employers. It's the first Canadian resource that links to resources, not only in Canada and the globe, it's available in English and French. Uh, back in 2018, it was awarded, lead, awarded a leading practice award by the Health Standards Organization. And most recently, it's been recognized as one of the top cancer su survivorship website in the world. So what we here's a, here's a breakdown in terms of the various sort of topic areas. And what you can see is there's some parallel 
topics between the survivors, healthcare providers, and employers. And we did this on purpose. The Canadian Cancer Survivorship um, Physician Paper talked about how it's important to improve communication between stakeholders. So we purposely wanted to outline similar steps with similar languages for each stakeholder here in order to sort of support communication and collaboration between these stakeholders in order to better support cancer survivors with return to work. As well on our website, we have an interactive tools section, um, which I'll talk about the tools a little more further. So if you're looking for the tools, you just go to the tools section on the top bar and, and it'll list you all, list all the tools that are available to you. Now, just to sort of warn you, we're in the process um, with a grant that was um, that Dr. Christy Mayu got. We're in the process of evaluating and updating the website. And so, so far we have the French version here, but um, don't be surprised if you, you see a different picture in the future in terms of that, because we'll have upgraded the usability and the navigation of the website. So I'd like to talk about the 10 steps, um, I can work, the 10 steps for return to work. And, and they fall into three basic categories, assessment, addressing challenges, and transitioning back to work. So um, this 10 step program is designed to be a navigation guide for all stakeholders involved in return to work. It's, it's supporting a multidisciplinary approach to encourage collaboration between healthcare providers, physicians, oncologists, with rehab, um, as well as um, with employers and, and most importantly, um, cancer survivors. It empowers the cancer survivor to self-manage. Um, it facilitates effective stakeholder communication, encourages strong survivor worship connections, and we'll talk a little more later about why that's important. And it suggests resolution to unexpected challenges that may arise during the return to work process. So if you're looking for where to find it, just if you go to the first step, which it says um, return to work, stay at work, and look at this. And as you can see, the I Can Work exists. We've, we've, we've adapted it now for cancer survivors as well as health care providers. We haven't got to the employers yet. We don't have the funds yet, but our, our, our wish is that down the road we'll, we'll have, we'll work on the I Can Work so it's parallel to the cancer survivor and health care provider. Related to healthcare providers, um, again, thanks to the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, um, they funded uh, a course that we created uh, for primary care providers, essentially for family physicians and nurse practitioners. Um, the collaboration great team that was involved, family practitioners, occupational therapy, our psychiatrists, um, as well as um, a, a medical oncologist, and cancer survivors that, in, that provided input and helped us refine this and, and make the course. And it's available for free um, for healthcare, uh, for primary care providers, including, and it's on the UBC Continuing Education Interprofessional Continuation website. Um, they can go there. I can only, can't encourage um, can, from primary care providers to take it because the kind of the thought is if we help if we help primary care providers do a good job on um, supporting cancer survivors with a return to work, we're hoping that um, we'll be less likely to have sort of struggles in the future for the cancer survivor. Similarly, we've created one for nurses. Um, for a while there, there's been under Cano, there is a uh, survivorship um, chapter in there that I can work on. Um, and, but uh, coming soon through the Lymphoma Leukemia Society um, or Leukemia Foundation, we'll have an updated version, again, in collaboration with CANO, um, to provide an updated version with updated research. So looking at the 10 steps return to work, the first step is, is to kind of take stock of all the things that influence return to work. So um, biopsychological, so that would be the things, you know, how does, how does the cancerous treatment affect your abilities? Um, what's the prognosis of your condition? Do you have pre-existing condition? So, you know, I think an example of that is maybe you're coping with um, cognitive challenges, but if you had a previous back injury, 
that would also be something that's going to influence, may potentially influence your employability. So looking at, you know, the duration of treatment or the effects of the cancer, all those things need to be sort of taken in consideration. Person-related factors are the things that are significant to the person. So how does somebody feel about work? Do they see work as good or bad? Some people see work as, as a sign of normal. Some people worry about it, you know, work is not good for you. And these are things that might need to be addressed. And also, you know, one indicator of getting back to work is if you're, if you're sort of expressing concern early on about um, your abilities to get back to work, those are the things that you want to kind of get the help sooner rather than later. And also person related, you know, sadly we'll see um, ethnicity and um, so social de demographic factors, age and things like that can have an influence in terms of access and work. And systems factors are, they're facilitators of barriers. So they could be things like, you know, waiting lists within healthcare systems to have um, reconstructive surgery, for example, or, or do you have access within your community or with your private insurance plan to pay for rehabilitation? Or how does your healthcare providers, are they there to guide you in terms of return to work? Well, certainly the research studies show that, um, that, that guidance in terms of what to expect in terms of return to work can be very helpful for the cancer survivor and the employer in terms of planning for return to work. And then lastly, the work site support. So thinking about, you know, is this a, what are the jobs? What are your physical abilities related to the job demands? Certainly we see in the research more physically demanding jobs. Sometimes it takes longer to get back to work. Also, it could be things like, do you have a supportive workplace? Now that could be, is your supervisor supportive? Are your colleagues supportive? Do you have good communication with the workplace? These can influence your return to work. So, you know, putting these things on the table and saying, you know, what's a facilitator barrier? Accessing the facilitators and addressing the barriers can be very helpful. The second step is assessing function. So, you know, taking stock. So evaluating your physical, psychological, cognitive ability and how that might affect your work ability. And it can be very helpful to utilize self-report forms or medical assessments, or in some cases to advocate for professional assessments. And if you want an idea of professional assessments that could be helpful under um, the communication section, if you look for professional assessments, I think for example, often an occupational therapy assessment like a functional capacity evaluation can be very helpful in terms of determining somebody's work ready and what can be done to in terms of accommodations or work adjustments. But sadly, a lot of people don't know about that great discipline and how it's helpful. Um, and if you're looking for the assessment section, if you, you just you go along, you scroll along the left hand side of the Cancer Work website, and, and often the assessment will funnel you in. So if you assessment of work abilities, you click on that, it's going to funnel you into some ideas about how to assess and cognitive abilities and psychological. And here, this is where you see the professional assessments where you can learn a little more. Why, why is it helpful to have things like uh, self-report and formal tools? Well, we had a, uh, Faith Heyman come and speak to our radiation oncology group at BC Cancer Agency, which in this video, um, she kindly allowed us to videotape it on the Cancer Work website. And she talked about, like, particularly in terms of insurance, how helpful it is to using sort of formalized tools out there in terms of adding credibility to people's opinion or to the doctor's opinion, even the cancer survivor's opinion about work readiness. And I'll give you an example. I once had a, somebody who was denied Canada Pension Plan because he had migraines and he, and, and, he was, and he was upset. And I said, well, you know, possibly if you, if something like using a migraine tracker where you talked about the intensity of the treatment and um, how it affects your function and how often that happened, might have sort of shown Canada Pension Plan how this might affect into your workability. So again, this is where tools can be very helpful. So an example of tool, and this was, um, we've been allowed to put this on the website um, uh, by uh, Dr. Fernstein, who was the former editor of the Journal of, of Occupational Rehabilitation and the current editor of the Journal of Cancer Survivorship. He created this web. This, this tool. 
And it's a very helpful tool because it talks about, you know, it's one thing to say you have cognitive challenges, but this tool sort of itemizes how this might affect your ability to work. And they've actually researched this with people getting back to work and found um, for those people that are back to work, it's been very helpful um, articulating how, how things like cognitive challenges might affect your workability. We've also developed fatigue tracking tool where, um, where it, it's, it's helpful, where you just, you punch in, you know, your assessment of how your energy is the start in the middle of the day, you, you transcribe this into another thing and it gives you a graph and it can be helpful because it can, you know, you can take to your healthcare provider and say, look, in the morning, I'm not getting better or in the mornings I'm struggling. And that can be very helpful because, you know, for some people, you may find that a lot of people are really good in the morning when they're initially recovering from cancer or cancer treatment, but they might sort of um, have energy issues in, in, in the afternoon. So it's good to sort of show that. That might sort of guide a return to work plan. Similarly, you might, sometimes you see this with people are coping with depression. Mornings can be bad for them and starting return to work in an afternoon or later in the morning might be helpful. So again, this can guide the return to work plan. Similarly, we have another tool called Energizer Drainer Tool. And that is just sort of asking you, you know, when I, when I sit down and do an activity, you assess your energy and afterwards. So sometimes I see with brain fog, they find when they sit down and they concentrate with things, you know, they can only handle it so long. And then they find they're really energized. And then afterwards they're depleted. But similarly, you want to explore right now, what are those things that can bring you back? Because maybe those things can be, um, allowed at the workplace. So for an example, if you find that, you know, you're absolutely exa exhausted doing physical activity, maybe having a power snooze at lunch hour is the, diff the difference between making it through the full day. So you want to track that. Or I've certainly seen some people where they've even tried out things like listening to relaxation podcasts for 20 minutes, say at lunchtime, and that's allowed them to come back and fulfill the day. Other tools that I use that are out there is like, I quite like this assessment, check your mood, but um, caution if, if the, the links looks funny, don't click on it. But this was developed by a psychiatrist at UBC. And um, it, 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 it kind of gives you, it's a self-report and allows you to look, discuss anxiety, depression, and even cognition. And he's also done some work in terms of, um, for physicians in terms of helping assess readiness for return to work based on psychological concerns. And, and again, um, also there is the PHQ-9, again, filling that out, at, um, or there's also something called the GAD, um, General Anxiety Disorder Questionnaire. So then those could be good. So if you're going in, say you're worried about depression or anxiety, go in and you show your doctor. Certainly I do that now with this, I have patients fill out this questionnaire. So when I'm asking our oncologists to make a referral to psychiatry, it's just not, it's just not me saying this is a good idea. It's actually sort of proven or it's been supported by a tool that I'm using. So the second step is understanding job demands. So in a perfect world, um, asking for a job analysis or job description from your employer. This can be helpful because it helps you determine your employer's expectations. And that's something you can share with your primary health care provider. And I always give an example of somebody who's in um, food service. So if you're, in, if you're in a cafe, you might be working in a local cafe as a food server. You might be expected to sort of bring things in from the back and mop the floors. And it might be more physically demanding, say, than when you're working in a high-end restaurant and you have a bus person that's helping you clear the tables. So again, um, educating your, your provider on the job demands can be very helpful in terms of part of them assessing your workability. Um, but not all employers do job analysis. So failing that, we do have a job analysis tool and the Cancer Work website. There's one tool for employers that they can fill out and there's also one tool that you could fill out. And, and it may seem a bit cumbersome initially, but um, even doing the first 15 pages can help you determine, you know, what are the challenges of return to work. Because, you, because what you may find in the job analysis, there's some things that you can do and there's some things you can't do. And so maybe that can be part of the return to work plan. These are the things I could come back to right away. These are things. And if you want to see what it looks like, here it is. 
So it's asking you, you just click on under that under the tools section. Um, it's asking your physical strength, physical demands, temperance, temperaments, psychological and cognitive demands, and even environmental conditions. You think, what? Environmental conditions. But once I was working with somebody who had neuropathy and couldn't feel the cold, and he was working in, a, in an, an area where he was working in a refrigerator, um, a large refrigerator system. So he needed, that was part of the picture in terms of uh, determining the return to work plan. So step four is basically after you've assessed all the challenges return to work, compared your 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 functional sort of challenges with the job that you have. The next step is to basically ask everybody for help. So particularly your healthcare provider, you know, ask the medical team or or the resources that are available to you, what medical, psychological, and rehab treatments available to you to help improve your abilities. So, and ask them if, if to refer to those resources, um, whether that's in-house or within the healthcare system, system or within the community, um, or or even for you to think about, you know, again, often if if you're sort of noticing, and I particularly recommend that if you're if you're the 30% of Canadians that have long-term disability, if you're having challenges with cognitive challenges and you're thinking this is going to be um, a, a concern to return to work. You know, asking the long-term disability provider, could they be funding a work and neuro-focused occupational therapist to give you some ideas about compensatory strategies? Basically, that's you know workarounds and educating your uh, coming up with ideas about um, job accommodations that can allow you to work productively, and and you know tweaking the, the work environment to allow it, allow you to go back to work successfully and productively. So. So related to that is take control. Um, more and more we're seeing um, services, you know, that are out there available online and, and to seek them out and look beyond even the cancer world. Um, utilize online resources, materials, group programs. And, I, I, and also it's really important to educate if you're on insurance like long-term disability, it's really important to educate yourself on how that works. So information is power. So you don't have any un unpleasant surprises down the road. Um, and advocate yourself with healthcare and insurance providers. So again, say, I'm noticing that I'm fatigued. Um, can you provide, would you consider providing a conditioning program out there that allow me to improve my abilities so I can get back to work faster? Um, and related to that, we have, if you're looking at some ideas about, um, the, we have the in the Cancer Works website under Cancer's Impact, uh, we have 23 common symptoms for cancer survivors. It describes the symptoms, potential vocational implications, and gives you some ideas of self-management and job accommodation ideas. And also under that section, we have um, we had two psychiatrists um, that helped write this article on emotional and psychological impact and what you could do about it and resources that they recommend. And again, related to psychological, many cancer survivors worry, want to go back to work with a, a, you know, a work-life balance or a work that feels less stressful. So we purposely created the workplace well-being section where it talks about how to manage stress within the job, within yourself, and, and looking at strategies to sort of mitigate stress. So, and um, if you're looking at resources, um, these are some of the resources that I refer to a lot. First of all, um, we have linked to resources, these in our website, and they link to resources that, um, vocational rehab resources, and two, two to have a call out is um, a BC Cancer Agency, we offer a vocational rehab program, but also Wellspring nationally and online offers return to work groups. And um, I believe the Pediatric Oncology Group for those in Ontario offers a SATV program where they provide sort of specific support, but you can go on there. And then again, speaking of Wellspring, I quite commonly often, to, we used to do uh, um, uh, a brain fog course at BC Cancer Agency, but Wellspring does an excellent course where we now defer to them and we've had great reviews. And I also like my anxiety plan. If you're coping with anxiety and things like this, is a great free resource that's available that gives you a great introduction to cognitive behavioral therapy and lots of strategies to help you in terms of managing anxiety. 
And also the Canadian Cancer Society, they have a community services locator. And you just sort of go in there and pump in what you want in the area community, and they'll come up with some ideas for you about what's available in your community. So that's a good start to find resources that might be available to you. Again, I think it's really important to know your insurance and within this section, communicating with your insurance provider and also under finance and disability, we also have a section. It's good to learn about how your insurance company, your long-term disability works. So you, so you can sort of see what's coming and plan and ideally access services that, you, that can be helpful to you. And here's an example. Um, you want to look at the qualific the definitions for eligibility and sometimes it starts with own occupation you're disabled from your own occupation but often at the two-year mark if they might be asking the question can you do anything that you're reasonably trained qualified to do so it's good to know that because the two-year mark can, can be pretty significant for some people maybe you, you you're not able to go back to your old job but maybe they can identify as something else you could do and also I don't see this very often, but partial disability, sadly, I don't see this offered very much, but it's worth to, for some cancer survivors, possibly they can't work, um, they can't work sort of full time, but is there provision for partial disability? So reading about that. And even in terms of um, be mindful that and rehab plans may vary, vary and they're not standardized, but it's always good to ask what's available to you to help you. Again, they're going to, an insurance company is more likely to offer you work-focused rehab. So they're not gonna offer you, say, physiotherapy for the sake of physiotherapy. But if it looks like there's a chance that it's gonna help get you back to work faster, um, there's, there's, the, there's the business case for them to provide you services that might not be available. But also be mindful that doctor's opinion is key. So, but specialist opinion, opinion may require. So, I think, for example, with psychological concerns that maybe they'll listen to your family's doctor so long, then sometimes they may sort of require a, um, a psychiatrist or something like that to provide an opinion about your workability. And, and also to be mindful that while on long-term disability, you need to fully, if your doctor is recommending that this is a good idea, you can't say, I don't want them to bug me. You need to be fully participating in medical treatments, rehab, return to work planning. Um, and I should say reasonable medical treatments. Um, and you know, and I learned this from an insurance course I took, which is sometimes employment may continue for the duration for disability. So again, all I can say is early education is power when it comes to insurance, because you want to sort of plan, like if it looks like you're not gonna be able to return to work, you wanna be looking at what your, or your former job, you wanna be looking at early rather than um, and planning. So you're not having to face economic hardship should you be cut off benefits. Step six is um, identifying and fostering workplace support. So first of all, really important to have your medical prof uh, professionals provide advance notice to return to work start date um, and necessary accommodations if possible, just because Sometimes your employer might have somebody temporary in, or they may need time to adjust so that you have a job to come, come back to. So if they can give them as, as much notice, that could be helpful to them. Not to mention, you know, you want a good relationship with them. So if you, if you make it easy for them, the better. Um, I think it's good to research the type of supports that's been available at your workplace, such as job accommodations. I'm always amazed when say, well, they, you know, some cancer survivors work with, they say, well, they can't do that. And then they've talked to um, their workplace, their union, and, and they found, oh yeah, no, they could accommodate that. But a really important thing is to maintain positive relationship with your colleagues, um, your supervisor, as well as your co colleagues, stay in contact with them if, um, and, and seek their support. And the reason why is we're seeing this in the research, and certainly it's been my experience in terms of my job is, is you, you know, collegial support is really helpful in terms of the soft landing at work. So you want that support because that can make a big difference. In fact, there's one study that found, you know, sometimes having colleague support would, could offset a supervisor that wasn't supportive. So kind of reaching out them, trying to go to those family barbecues or these, those work barbecues and those, and saying, you know, I miss you guys is never a bad thing. But if you are feeling, some cases, a lot of times people feel they're worried about um, their boundaries in terms of speaking up for themselves or like reaching out. They don't want to be overwhelmed with hearing about the stress at work or pressure. 
So if you're feeling like that, maybe this is a good time to look at us in order to kind of get the support that um, that you need in the workplace or, or in, the, uh, in order to sort of guide how you can speak to them. And another big idea that comes up is um, some people about how they're going to disclose. So, so some people sort of worry about how much they're going to disclose. So we wrote an article here about disclosure. And um, so that gives you some ideas. And I always sort of quote this University of Toronto study. It was an insurance study. And they found while the vast majority found that disclosing their cancer was helpful return to work, 17% regretted it. So you can't, it's not, it can be helpful because sometimes people can fill in the blanks negatively. It can be unhelpful. But in some cases it can be unhelpful. So if you find this article it might be helpful. And in some cases, um, it can be helpful if you're worried about what is your employer's obligation, your obligation. There, we have a law policy section and we have a list of human rights organizations. So again, they're free, they're low cost or no cost organizations where you can talk to them. It's not like you wanna be quoting human rights right away because you've gotta think about your relationship with your employer, but it, I don't think it hurts to know your rights. And, and for example, in some cases, maybe your line supervisor doesn't know duty to accommodate, but, but the, if you have human resources or um, a department or a disability management, their role might be to educate your line manager, but it starts with having a good knowledge yourself. And, and in some cases, I would recommend if you're saying working a small employer, they may not know their duty to accommodate. I would encourage you to, to encourage them to look at the Cancer Work website, the employer section. So step seven is to assist in developing the return to work plan. Um, so, so with this, you want to get guidance as mentioned. And I forgot to mention to you with these, this step program, it's not an orderly step program. You may be visiting some of these steps before, um, simultaneously or before others. So with this, you know, we mentioned previously, get the guidance from your healthcare provider. I like the idea of having your healthcare provider work with you on this. And often it boils down to what your healthcare provider says. So it's not about, for human rights protection, it's not about your preference. It will be something that your doctor or your nurse practitioner will need to recommend. So getting an idea of start and end date, reassessment days to evaluate pro progress, any medical restrictions, limitations, job accommodations that might be helpful. My understanding is it, it ultimately is up to the employer about um, job accommodations, but you can make, there can be recommendations for job accommodations and you can also, but couch it with, you know, I noticed that when I take uh, my lunch at a power snooze at a lunch break, that's the difference between me being productive and not cranky in the afternoon. So, you know, saying things like that, presenting them in a way that promotes discusses the, the value in terms of productivity can be really helpful. And also, I often encourage physicians to label a return to work trial rather than just to sort of recognize that sometimes we're going in, you know, people are making their best guess, but sometimes you don't know how it ultimately it's going to work. And also be mindful that when you do a graduated return to work, which is often the most common way to return to work, that is in itself a conditioning program and an assessment. So calling a return to work trial can be very helpful. So if you're wanting to learn a little more about the cancer work return to work planner, um, there, there's, a, there's some guidance for you and your employer to work through in terms of inputting um, restrictions and limitations and, and need for job accommodation. And I think the big punchline in this, this planner is, is having regular check-ins in order to assess and address challenges that they come back, come up. And that includes even when you're back to work. It's like, it's um, just because somebody's resumed full hours doesn't mean you may not necessarily struggle. So plan to have those check-ins even after you return to work um, for a few months or a number of months in order to sort of problem solve. So the eighth is prepare for imminent return to work. So discuss with your healthcare provider ways to manage anxiety, sleep, nutrition, to ensure that you're physically, mentally returned to work. And I think sleep is a classic example. I'm always amazed, like, again, when people are off, they're, they're working around their sleep challenges. Better to put these sleep challenges on the table before you go back to work so they're addressed. Um, 
consider if safe participating work simulation. So if it's considered safe for your healthcare provider. So again, you know, if you have an arm injury or a shoulder problem and you're a physically demanding job, I think you need your clearance by your healthcare provider. But say, for example, you're a sedentary job, I really encourage people to sit at their desk, say starting an hour a day, Monday to Friday, and slowly increasing it. Because there's two parts of that. That's an assessment, but it's also a work conditioning program. I used to teach employment programs to people that didn't have cancer, just off work, and they were exhausted after attending a six hour session. So allowing yourself to kind of slowly build up your condition, it can be very helpful. And again, for you to try out accommodations to sort of see what works and discuss these ideas to see if that can help you return to work. And if you want some ideas of job accommodation, um, on our website, um, created by Kyla Johnson, who's an occupational therapist from General, Jewish General, she created some ideas about ways um, there could be tweaks within the work that you do or at the job in order to help you with various symptom challenges. And similarly, um, we also have a section on the website developed um, by an occupational therapist from Neil Square Foundation. And she had written some ideas about um, adaptive aids and assistive technology, you know, low cost and no cost ways that can help you in terms of return, return to work. And also in there, um, there's something called the Job Accommodation Network. And that's a US resource. But this was developed in, by um, employers. They gave some ideas of job accommodations that are out there. So that's worth looking. And just recently I was working, I'm, co I'm working with somebody who's got challenges with um, numbness in her fingers. And so as a result, keyboarding kind of hurts a bit or, or and, it, and it's hard for her to do. So I was looking for voice activated software and I actually sort of barreled into this and, and found some really good suggestions in terms of technology that was out there. The next part is managing the work expectations. So again, the advantage of having a return to work plan laid out there is then you can go back and say, according to the work return to work plan. And again, if you're thinking, you know, there's gonna be a pushback in terms of your graduated return to work or return to work plan if, is to sort of learn ways that you can be um, boundaries and assertiveness. Sometimes I see for people, it's not simply, sometimes it doesn't feel okay for them to say that I need to go home now, according to the graduated return to work plan. And that's where boundaries are really important. What's it mean for you to sort of stick to the plan or assertiveness, assertiveness and conflict resolution. The point of that is, is you know, to articulate what you need, but not in a confrontational way, in a way that, you know, it's, it's all, the ultimate focus is to have ena enable better um, uh, constructive communication. And I also think you want to think about your family members. They might be used to you being around the house and available to pick up dry cleaning or, or groceries and things like that. And you might find that you're going to be tired. And so now's the time to say, you know, I'm going to get back to work and I may need you to help out a bit more because I'm in my initial phases of return to work, I'm going to be tired. And then the last step is monitoring your progress. So with that, it's schedule check-ins with your primary care provider if you can you know just a check-in and to assess if are there any challenges and at that check-in you're going to talk about symptom management improving work function um, ask for rehab support if needed you know they may need to update the medical note in order to advise your insurance provider like for example if the plan needs to be slowed down or tweaked at all and, and I know it's a mixed review here, but um, I've heard some people say schedule medical appointments on work hours. I think you have to read the environment because I, you know, you want to also think about your employer too. Ultimately, you, you, it's a bit of a, you want to optimize the sort of your supervisor relationships. So if you can, you know, schedule medical appointments and non-work hours if possible, just so it's less disruptive for them ultimately so that it's not going to um, cause resentment and things like that. But again, if it's looking like these medical appointments are gonna be disruptive, I think that's, that needs to be articulated in the return to work plan. So, you know, there's no unpleasant surprises for your employer. So now that's in terms of the 10 steps for return to work. And some of these steps, you know, in terms of assessing your workability, assessing your function can be very helpful in terms of looking for work. 
But now I'd like to look at looking for work. And within that section, we have under changing jobs and looking for work, we have um, everything about changing work priorities, which is sometimes people feel differently about work. And there's an article that um, we had social workers from BC Cancer Agency, clinical counselors basically providing input. We also had job searching clear career exploration section. That career exploration section was developed by um, the, the head voc rehab counselor at our local rehab hospital. So lots of good links. Now within job search, you want to, I think it's really important. If you're feeling a little self-conscious about um, getting back to work, I think what you want to do is just become better than the other person at job search skills. So overcompensate. So, and in some cases, there are free courses within your province and within your community that you can take to improve your, your job search ability. I know for me, if I'd lost my job tomorrow, I'd be attending Work BC job search because you can always learn more. And, um, and the other thing is sometimes I, I come across people that they, 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 they I applied for the perfect job, the interview really went well, and, and they stop looking and don't do that because then they're devastated when they don't get the job because you know they may that that employer might have had somebody else in mind and they were going through the motions we just don't know what's going on or or maybe the funding's being pulled back we don't know so i encourage you to sort of see um job searches as a job and just to pretend you didn't get the job and just keep moving on ultimately you want to generate as many job offers for yourself and, and ultimately, again, set dedicated time for job searching and reward yourself. So pretend it's like this can be part of your work conditioning. You sit down in the morning, you do job search. And, and I think job search often can be about the marathon and, you know, kind of keeping your motivation is really important. So looking at little ways you can reinforce yourself, like going off and, and, and going off and doing, watching that fun show, TV show or on the line computer or something like that basically schedule in sort of rewards for yourself so you can keep plodding along in order to finally get that job. And related to job search, it's really, it can be very helpful to be pretty clear about what you want. And so as mentioned, taking career assessments to understand interests, aptitudes, strengths, and values, these are often the components like interests are what you're interested in, aptitudes are kind of what, what are you good at, what are the strengths are, things that you, you've developed skills and expertise. And values are like secondary interests. They're the things like, they're like interests, but they're like, what are the perks that you need at the job? Do you, do you need a lot of variety? Do you want economic return? So looking at those things to help you. And when you see enough sort of overlap come up, that might be helping you guide you in terms of finding your job that you want. And, you know, part of career exploration is to consider, you know, what do you enjoy doing? What do you, and I always ask cancer survivors when I'm doing, um, um, career counseling, you know, what are they reading, for example, where are, they, where are they spending their time? And there's lots of online resources to research industries and job opportunities. Like, again, we have WorkBC in British Columbia, great resource. And, and network about job industries. And I'm going to talk to you about informational interviews, but, you know, get out and about career fairs, social media. And, you know, in some cases, um, sometimes if it does get you in trouble with your long-term disability provider, sometimes doing volunteering or internships can expose you to um, skills um, and give you a look-see in terms of, of things you might want to do. I'm into sort of strategic volunteering. So if, if you're, working, you're working with the public, maybe, um, or you're trying to learn a skill set, you would consider that in terms of um, volunteering opposed to, for example, in an interim, you want to learn something. So later on, you can be discussing that when you apply for a job. Now for both, um, both network, both for job search and career exploration, networking is where it at, it's at. 80% of their job not, are not posted. So it, it may push you out of your comfort zone, but really you want to start networking. You want, and the reason why is you want to get to the job first. You want to see if this is job is a match. You want to fest, foster job search mentors, like people that are looking out for you and develop that network for now and even the future. So questions I find really helpful is, and this is a great warm up question, tell me about how you got into the field, because that's telling you, telling you about that person's career track. So why you might not be ready for the job they're doing, they, they're telling you how they work their way up to the ranks. And they're also telling you about employers that potentially may hire 
again, say if you're coping with any type of disability, asking, tell me about a typical day is a great way of walking through the day without having to disclose anything about yourself. So you can quietly decide, is this a fit for you functionally? And I think from a values point of view, what do you like, dislike can be really helpful to determine, you know, the, is, is the work environment going to be something that's going to fit to you? And then you switch it to you and say, give my skills and experience, what do you think I could do? And there might be jobs or um, job titles that you may not have thought about. And then you go one step further and say, who hires people for such jobs? And then ultimately you want to ask for another contact because then you keep going. And, um, and, and I forgot, it's not on the slide here, but it's really important to say thank you in order to acknowledge people's time. In terms of interview preparation, again, you really want to embrace your strengths. So if you're feeling a little insecure about your cancer history, you need people that value to remind you about what you have to offer. Because if you don't believe in yourself, why will an employer? And if you're concerned, prepare explanations about gaps in your work history and practice. So you want to practice and you want to make it into like short, succinct, and, and not emotionally loaded. So it's, it's just rolling off you with no edge. So because uh, if you're not comfortable with it, they'll pick up on it. But if you're talking about disclosure, but be truthful, but focus on the positive aspects. So again, if you're disclosing your disability, that way, if you're disclosing your disability, you only need to if you need accommodation. But if you're going to disclose, um, spin it positively, saying, you know, I was off for health challenges, which are resolved, and that time made me really clear about how I, what I wanted to do work and, and how I could contribute to your organization might be an example. And remember the work history question is one part of the interview. Um, when I was at, um, when I was teaching job search previously in another organization, we used to videotape people. So I'd encourage you to do that um, with your, say your, your smartphone, because while people thought they absolutely blew an interview question, they were surprised that it didn't show. So again, the more practice you could be in job search, the, the, the better you're gonna get at it. It is a skill and it's, it's a muscle to be developed and you'd be surprised to um, get better and better at it. So this is just, uh, thank you so much. And if you have, um, want to be directed, sadly, we're, we're not in a position to sort of answer sort of questions in terms of individually, but we can direct you to the website, parts of the website that, and it is a very comprehensive website. So odds are the answer's there. So feel free to drop us a line and we'll try and direct you. And again, I'd like to acknowledge um, currently the sort of the th three big players um, in terms of the Cancer and Work website. And um, again, I think we, uh, myself, Christine, and Simon Pierre Dubier, who's our IT person, who's very helpful in terms of helping us. Um, and just sort of a last thing is if you're aware of resources, freely available resources that, um, that are work relevant, um, to cancer survivors, you know, want to hear about it because if it's available, we want to make it available on our website. So I think that's it for now. So thank you. And I'm, I think we're open to questions now. Yeah, so, yeah, so we'll, we'll go to the chat and see if there's any questions. Um, I think, I think one of the first questions I had for you, Maureen, was um, through cancer and work, is there, um, are there mentors or mediators who can, can help walk through these processes from your website or, or do you more, or is there more resources available to find those people? Well, uh, curiously enough, um, the, the grant that Christine has is we are, she's doing a usability study. So we do have a little uh, pop-up that, that is to direct you to parts of the website, uh, but we will be, and we also have some navigation videos that are gonna come online to tell people about where to go to. And ultimately, if you're not finding where you need to go and questions, you know, if you can just, again, back to, um, if you want to reach out to us in the contact section, we'll try and direct you to parts. Um, well, well, 
if anybody else has any questions, just pop them either in the question section or the chat. We'll give you a, a few minutes or a, a minute or so um, before we wrap up. Um, but what I want, I wanted to say thank you, Maureen, for your time and the presentation today. If you want to keep up to date with our Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor series, you should sign up for our newsletter to receive notice of all upcoming topics. Next, uh, at the end of the month will be our last one uh, until the end of the summer, and it'll be about occupational therapy more in depth about return to work. Um, so it'll kind of play off this presentation a little bit more. And, yeah, and also don't forget that all our webinars are recorded, so they're posted on YouTube and our Facebook page if you don't get a chance to log in live. And so I'll take one last look, see if there's anything that popped up. No, it looks like you were very thorough, Maureen. You answered everybody's <laughs> questions. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, well, thank you again so much for allowing like, to talk about cancer work. And I really do hope well, we're always open to people's thoughts uh, about how we can improve things and, um, and, and, and resources, if we can connect people to resources. And, you know, we even have a research section where we're trying to, you know, make it easy for people to get to the information to support cancer and work. Well, that's excellent to hear, and we really thank you for coming on today and providing the information you did. I'm sure it was uh, very valuable to everyone. And with that, I want to thank everyone who did join us today, and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.